The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. At the core of it, Vietnam learns to live with China and learns to live with that power disparity. There are ongoing and persistent disputes and issues, but there are also other aspects of relationship that are doing relatively well, and neither of them offset the other one. But the relationship with China is the one that really dictates Vietnam's other foreign policy decisions. In this episode, Vietnam's balancing act with powers great and near. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Vietnam's recent history with its giant neighbour China hasn't always been an easy one. The low point came in 1979 when the two countries were briefly at war and relations remained fractious till the early 1990s when there was finally a normalisation of ties. Since then, deaf diplomacy, as well as the opening up of economies on both sides of the border, has largely brought peace and prosperity. Now, Vietnam, once a key Soviet ally in Southeast Asia, takes its self-determination very seriously. In a region where the pressure of China's rising ambitions is being felt just off the shoreline in the South China Sea. Vietnam's foreign relations strategy is one of multi-alignment, a studiously hedging approach that seeks to balance Hanoi's ties to the world's great powers, as well as regional ones, while favouring none. On the security front, Vietnam's other strategic pillar, self-reliance, explicitly states it will accept no military alliances, nor will it take sides in conflicts between other countries. So how well is Vietnam's approach working to safeguard or assert its interests in the region and beyond? What's behind catchphrases like multi-alignment and self-reliance? And as Vietnam's diplomatic profile is seen to be on the rise as it integrates further into the global economy, how much agency does it really have to determine its own future? Joining me to look at how Vietnam navigates its relations with the rest of the world is Dr. Huang Lei Tu, a prolific writer, commentator, academic and policy analyst. She's held positions with the Australian National University's Strategic and Defence Studies Centre and Australia's Strategic Policy Institute, among others. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Huang. Thank you, Ali. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm a big fan of Ear to Asia, so it's great to be with you. We love that. Thank you very much. Can we start with a very big picture question? How would you describe Vietnam's approach to foreign policy in terms of multi-alignment and self-reliance in practice? What does it mean? Yes. So before Vietnam arrived at that big concept of multi-alignment and self-reliance, I think there has been a lot of evolution, reforms and transformation in its foreign policy thinking over the past several decades. I think in practice now, what it means is to safeguard its self-reliance, safeguard its self-agency and self-determination, and not to be overly reliant or dependent on any other country or any other external actors. So Vietnam wants to be active, proactive indeed, um, as it often mentions in its own policy documents, and uses diplomacy as one of these key tools of statecraft, oftentimes even replacing where possible uh, defense. So diplomacy has been really elevated after the reforms in the 1980s. And the role of diplomacy is to benefit Vietnam, its position internationally, not only politically, but also economically. So, for example, with facilitating trade, economic relations and foreign investment. So Vietnam is very serious about its foreign policy and considered is one of its key ways to progress and develop as well. And we'll come to those reforms in the 80s a little later. But given the the focus on diplomacy, what does it mean in terms of defence policies and potential security cooperation? How do they fit in with a multi-alignment strategy? 
So Vietnam, as you remember, was very much isolated as a result of those Cold War era wars already, and especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it found itself in a very disadvantageous position where it basically didn't have any friends. And it suffered under, obviously, the sanctions uh, that America and the world has imposed on it. And that created a situation Uh, very disadvantages for Vietnam, not only for its politics, but really for everyday people as well who, who suffered from simply poverty because of lack of economic relations with most of the world. And clearly, Vietnam needed to invest and rethink its foreign policy, invest in its uh, diplomacy. So the reforms that I've referred to, the Doi Moi, started in 1986 have created an opportunity for Vietnam to open doors, literally, to uh, friends regardless of political systems. And that gradually have helped Vietnam to reform its foreign policy and becoming more proactive in befriending everyone and having no enemies. That was actually the motto, friends of everyone, no enemies. And because of its size, its economic capability, Vietnam's defense capability had been relatively limited, especially when you compare to bigger countries. It understood that gap in its defense limitations uh, and relied more so on diplomacy to befriend more countries and decrease its hostile environment internationally and engage and integrate with the world and therefore in some way offset that pressure on the defense sector, on defense side of the house. And in the recent years, we would see Vietnam's very active, not only traditional foreign policy, but also defense diplomacy in many interactions and increasing number of engagement with partners in the region to serve that purpose. So despite the self-reliance, Is Vietnam able to pursue security cooperation agreements? I mean, where is the line between going it alone and actually having, if not formal military alliances, certainly having cooperative agreements? Yes. So that's one of the gaps that I've criticized in some of my academic articles, that there is a gap between going it alone and there's limits to self-reliance. And also there is limit to, indeed, if you look deeper beyond the surface, in Vietnam's greater integration policy. As you know, Vietnam has existing disputes territorial disputes with much greater neighbor, which is China. Now, obviously, there is a huge disparity in terms of capability in those two countries, and Vietnam understands its more disadvantageous position. But making friends and getting into different cooperation arrangements, whether it is called comprehensive partnerships or strategic partnerships or all kind of other names, a means that Vietnam is willing and open for cooperation in a number of areas, including defense ones, but it will stop short of formal alliance relationships, the way the alliance is known in Australia, for example, very binding with the US, for example. That is a result of a number of factors, including the failed alliances that Vietnam had had during the Cold War. But also that speaks to that first concept that we started with, which is self-reliance, right? And expanding the network of friends and partners will be an example of that multi-alignment politics that Vietnam is pursuing and is hedging with many partners rather than bidding on one or two in particular. And it's expanding the network of friends and partners so that it offsets its power disparity compared with other powers in the region. And you've given us a little sense of the historical context of that. But I wonder to what extent this foreign policy approach is caught up in political ideology. Yes. So Vietnam, as I mentioned, um, through uh, recent decades, have been trying to get away from ideology because that really impeded its international network. So after the Soviet Union collapse, Vietnam also had gone through its own reforms called Doi Moi and realized it needed to be much more practical than ideological as it was before. 
and it extended friendship to all countries regardless of political system. Its foreign policy was no longer dictated by solidarity with communist or socialist countries. And in the recent years and decades, as it integrated with the world, it carried on that pragmatic foreign policy approach where it suppressed its own political and ideological views. But underneath that, I think there is a very strong also sense within Vietnamese leadership that it needs to be self-reliant. It needs to preserve its own legitimacy and political control uh, within the country. That way is of making friends and, and partnership with many countries, but not being influenced by any of them. You know, it's not ideology as it used to be during the Cold War, where the world is divided to the communist and capitalist world. This is more of shielding Vietnam to the degree it gets integrated with globalization, but preserve its political views, political system, and all the decisions it has when it comes to politics. And there is enormous continuity, isn't there, with foreign policy? I know that uh, I was asking earlier, before we started recording this podcast, about recent leadership changes in Hanoi, but they don't really have an impact on foreign policy. There is great consistency. Yes, so Vietnam's foreign policy is consistent. I think the line that has been set is being continued regardless of changing leadership position. Uh, We've recently had a number of changes, as you mentioned, in terms of president or even, you know, the longtime foreign minister who had been in the role for 10 years and it was well known to Australia as well. And the changes in every uh, five years, there's a change in top leadership Although in the last one, they actually preserved the top position, which is the party secretary general, despite his age limit. But the core is that despite change of persons in in the leadership positions, the line of foreign policy remains uh, largely the same. Now, the conduct may a little bit change certain preferences or at certain decision point, obviously, There are some contestation within, even though it's quite obscure for external observer, but the personality of the top leadership will, to some degree, have some influence. But that wouldn't steer away from the core principles. And if we look at how well the policy is working for Vietnam, perhaps if we do that by looking at some very specific relationships, and if we start with Southeast Asia, in that region, how does... Vietnam make its presence felt and protect its interests? I mean, it's very active in ASEAN, isn't it? It is, and it worked hard to get into ASEAN. As I mentioned earlier, after Cold War, it needed to normalise its relations with most of the world, including its very close neighbours in the Southeast Asian region, because during the Cold War, Vietnam was in the communist side. So there was a lot of uh, lingering distrust to Vietnam within Southeast Asia, within ASEAN, because the original ASEAN, some would say, was set up to actually counter the effect of a spillover of the Vietnam War and Cold War more largely. Um, So it took a while for Vietnam to integrate in that community, work very hard to be admitted into ASEAN and the ASEAN enlargement then uh, meant uh, also including other Southeast Asian members from the continental Southeast Asia, like Cambodia, Laos and Myanmar, other than Vietnam. In the beginning of Vietnam's membership, the whole ASEAN community worked very hard to integrate Vietnam and others and just to minimize the gap between the old ASEAN and the new ASEAN. Now, Vietnam was considered then as a second tier country with obviously a less economically developed But in recent years, one would argue that it really caught up and is no longer considered the second tier ASEAN economy. It is very active in diplomatic activities of ASEAN. It has successfully hosted a number of ASEAN rotational chairmanships, 
And it is full of initiatives, including what it often claims, like, for example, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Plus, which engage beyond ASEAN members. So Vietnam has earned a reputation of very active member of ASEAN, even to a degree where some would say increasingly taking up more of a leadership role, or at least in some niche, I would add to that, including more of a security agenda in the lack of other leadership, because by design, ASEAN is not having official leaders, but oftentimes the big brother Indonesia had been considered as one in recent years. Perhaps relatively, that role of Indonesia had subsided compared to the past, but Vietnam's activeness in the ASEAN community have created a a reputation of a very strong and, in fact, right now, indispensable member of ASEAN community. And is it very ambitious in in terms of being a a leader in the region? I think there is limit to uh, what Vietnam is willing and able to do. As I've written elsewhere as well, you know, leadership in ASEAN can also be at times a liability. And I don't think any country, even Indonesia will be of all its size, can claim, you know, full leadership. I think it's always going to be selective areas. For Vietnam, obviously, Being in ASEAN was one way to, as I said, integrate in the region and beyond and become a platform to engage with the broader world and kind of leave the reputation of the past behind. And it was an important platform for exercising its not only diplomatic agenda, but also for voicing its stance, its position in terms of the South China Sea dispute. And Obviously, the experience in ASEAN has also made Vietnam recalibrate its own assessment of what ASEAN can and cannot be in terms of advancing its South China Sea claims. But it is an important platform nevertheless, and it will remain so even though a lot of external observers in particular or even internal are frustrated with ASEAN's slow progress. I don't think Vietnam harbors particularly strong leadership crave in all of ASEAN. For example, it stays very quiet on the issue of Myanmar crisis right now, but it will be quite vocal when it comes to issues like South China Sea disputes or the Mekong issues as well. So it's very selective and it is obviously very closely knitted to what Vietnam considers as its national interest. You mentioned Cambodia before, and if we can look specifically at the relationship with Cambodia, because they do boast a a very long friendship, but there is deep mutual distrust, isn't there? There is a complicated history, obviously. But on the personal level, current leader Hun Sen, we'll see how much longer, has personal relationship with Vietnam as well. But it's not just the complexity of the bilateral relations. There is others in the play as well. So if you consider relationship to be, for example, triangular, to offset the power asymmetry, so to speak, then Cambodia would consider, you know, China as one of a way to offset its power asymmetry with Vietnam, for example. And relationship with China had always added to that complexity. And China's role in Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge regime, or even now, it's always a complicating factor. Despite that friendliness and neighborliness with Cambodia as well, there are a lot of issues that Vietnam could be apprehensive about or uh, concerned about, especially with those alleged rumors of Chinese presence in some of the critical infrastructure in Cambodia, including the dual use access to some of their bases or ports. So on the strategic level, it's more complicated than the bilateral relations only. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website. 
website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore, and I'm joined by policy analyst Dr Huang Lei Tu. We're talking about the opportunities and challenges facing Vietnam on the foreign relations front. Let's look at China and now the bilateral relationship between Vietnam and Beijing. It's such a an important relationship. You've described it as complex and often troubled. And you've mentioned the South China Sea. Clearly, they have major territorial disputes, but they also have extensive cooperation, don't they? So, how do you how do you explain the relationship between Vietnam and China? Well, because they are neighbors, and often、um, there is a saying in Vietnam that you know, even if they wanted to, they could not pick up and move away from China. So they have to learn to live with China. And even there are anecdotes saying that you know, for the troubled thousands of years history of multiple conquests, occupation, but also coexistence, they are figuring a way how to work with China. Right. So. For example, there is a saying that the first thousand years we didn't know how to deal with China, but the second thousand of years we are starting to figure this out, and it goes back way beyond this current modern relationship of the country states、um, as we know it. What I'm trying to say is, at core of it, Vietnam learns to live with China and learns to live with that power disparity. There are ongoing and persistent, and I don't think、uh, in any near future resolvable disputes and issues. But there are also other aspects of relationship that are doing relatively well, and neither of them offset the other one. So the ongoing dispute on the South China Sea or Mekong, for that matter, and other issues will continue. And the fact that China is Vietnam's biggest trading partner. Won't necessarily offset that. They just have to multitask, so to speak, at the same time. In the policy language, Vietnam called it compartmentalizing the relationship. Although I would dispute、uh, to a degree that can be put into one compartment rather than outgrow all of the chests of drawers,、uh, so to speak. Well, indeed, we have seen, haven't we, in more recent years? I'm thinking 2014, for example, where attempts to compartmentalise issues over territorial claims have simply not worked because it's spilled over into the economic and the diplomatic area. That's right. It spilled over to economic and diplomatic, but also ethnic and social relations as well. There had been a brief riots, and obviously, you know, the anti-Chinese sentiment、uh, had a wave、uh, up there. It's not completely possible to compartmentalize, and in fact, the relationship with China, or the troubled relationship with China, is the one that really. Dictates Vietnam's other foreign policy decisions and its national strategy overall. In fact, because that multi-alignment that we mentioned in earlier on is actually also to offset that power disparity and potential threats coming from China. So it is really the motto that is guiding Vietnam's foreign policy and defense policy overall. But having said that, like you mentioned, on other aspects, the countries are willing to speak and even cooperate. Comes in waves, of course, but on the level of party-to-party -party relationships, for example, the meetings are fairly regular. Recently, the Prime Minister of Vietnam, Pak Min Ching, visiting Beijing in June. And in fact, after Xi Jinping's third term renewal, Vietnam's Party Secretary General Nguyen Phu Trang was the first foreign、uh, leader to visit China. So there are accents like that, emphasizing the good side of relationship. Along of every of those visits, there will be multiple cooperation agreement signed, whether it's about. Agriculture, transport, environment, health, science, cooperation in all different、uh, range of fields, speaking to the positive and cooperative nature of the comrade. 
while at the same time persevering with their mutually disputed claims. So what Vietnam's call that policy is cooperation while struggle. So cooperate where they can, but struggle and fight for its legitimate claims where they have to. But how does Vietnam enforce its maritime claims, and particularly up against China's increasing assertiveness? I take your point about struggle where we we must, but what does that look like in practice? Essentially just agreeing to disagree, or is it more than that? That's uh, one step, but... Using diplomacy is one um, of the toolkits. So there are a number of toolkits. For example, internationalizing the disputes. So Vietnam has been very active in making international media aware of the issue and bringing the issue up, whether it's through ASEAN platforms or beyond. And as you know, China would prefer to call South China Sea disputes or disagreement as bilateral issues rather than regional or international ones. It wants to keep us just a dispute in the private conversation with a particular claimant country, whereas Vietnam wants to make it an international one. And it contributes through um, bringing this up in ASEAN meetings, whether on official channels or even contributing to the scholarship of the South China Sea issues, including contributing to the South China Sea conferences annually in a number of countries right now. You mentioned the incident in 2014. One of the strategy to offset that was to invite many international media to cover the issue, right? So it became an issue known more widely than China wished wanted to. Another tool is obviously multilateralizing. So again, where ASEAN comes into the picture, so it is rejecting China's way of putting this as a bilateral issue only. It's actually a regional issue, right? It's a claim that are affecting more countries. And also Vietnam is sort of assisting and facilitating other actors who are not claimants to be involved in dialogues and observations and discussing the matters as well. For example, invites Australia, US and Japan and other countries that are not claimants. They don't have direct claims in the South China Sea, but they are also using the passages of the South China Sea to trade and treat it as the global commons. And of course, legal warfare is another one. Vietnam's increasingly relying on the legality of the claim. So, for example, a big win for Philippines in 2016 was the arbitral tribunal ruling in the Hague that ruled that China's nine dash line has no legal basis. That was not only a win for the Philippines, but it was also a win for Vietnam that it has the legal base now to reject China's claims. So there are a number of toolkits that Vietnam relies on. And on practical level, and if I may draw a more popular cultural example, is recently there was a case of the movie Barbie, where there was a map that allegedly had China's nine dash line in it. And Vietnam ban it from release in Vietnam because it spread the wrong information, popularized the map, the claims that had been already ruled as illegal. It is not the first movie and it's certainly not the last uh, popular culture product that has that map in it. But that's a very practical example of how Vietnam is actively rejecting China's claims. It has to be said, though, of course, who would have thought in Barbie? And it is a rather unusual portrayal of the map in that film. But what about China's Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI? Because if you look at other Southeast Asian states, a lot of them have jumped on board. Is it fair to describe Vietnam as more cautious? And and I guess we've got to put that in the context of recognising that China is Vietnam's biggest trading partner. Indeed, China is Vietnam's biggest trading partner. But on the strategic level, if you put it relative to other countries in the region, I would say it is a fair assessment that Vietnam is relatively more cautious than some of other neighbors. And obviously, that goes both ways, right? China is not offering Vietnam as many investment projects or as many infrastructure projects as it is with some other countries, at least on the promises and pledge level. For example, that was one way that 
China tried to lure and uh, woo Philippines under the Duterte administration, right? It is also very actively engaged in investment in infrastructure in Indonesia, much more so than, for example, in Vietnam. And it goes both ways. So every time there is Chinese investment involved, I think the Vietnamese would think twice um, if they accept it or not. And there is also an issue of what people think, not only the leadership, but the people's trust to Chinese investment and projects. There was an example where Chinese special economic zones were supposedly settled in northern Vietnam in the harbor area of Haiphong region. But there were uh, popular protests against that, uh, which stopped that. And that's exactly relating to that issue of strategic trust. Is that a broadly held view among Vietnamese people? Is there this underlying distrust of China? I think to a degree, yes. Even though I think there is also an unspoken admiration to what China has been able to pull off in terms of you know, economic progress and development and pulling people out of the poverty. There is that admiration too. But when it comes to Vietnam and Vietnam's territory, Vietnam's land and rights, I think there is historically conditioned apprehension. Having said that, though, Vietnam is not immune to Chinese products and Chinese investment either. It is in need of external foreign investments. It is in need of, of course, the market supply. As you mentioned, China is Vietnam's biggest trading partner. The market is not immune from the Chinese products, and it's actually overflowed the Chinese products, I think, beyond what they would want to see, simply because of the proximity in, and quantity, but also also affordability. I think affordability is a great asset that China has over Vietnam, but over other countries as well. So even though perhaps, let's say, a railways project or metro project in the capital area, even though perhaps the preference would be to opt for other suppliers and contractors, for example, Japan or European ones, affordability it would be also one of the deciding factors. So, for example, in Hanoi, the metro line, it's actually monorail, was actually made by the Chinese. We've talked about the relationship with China. What about the US? Because Vietnam has a growing relationship with America, doesn't it? And there are various areas there of bilateral cooperation as well. That's right. I would say that Vietnam's relationship with the US currently is on the upswing. It's probably the best it's been in terms of recent history of the unified Vietnam. And it has potential to grow and increase in depth as well. So I'm quite positive about the trajectory of the relationship, even though there are lasting challenges, including, you know, the disparity of their political systems, which will inherently have a lasting divergence and differences in how they see the world or how they see certain issues. And of course, dictated by the historical experience of having in the living memory uh, fought a long and very bloody war with each other. But I think that is slowly subsiding. And the fact that in recent years, America is more willing to address the issues of war legacies and assist with that, that they come to a stage where they are willing to address those very sensitive issues in order to move on. So there are, of course, lingering issues, but at least there are also willingness on both sides to address them without which they wouldn't be able to move on to much deeper security or defense cooperation. Now, we are at the stage where there are certain convergence in terms of strategic thinking between these two countries, especially when it comes to China and China's uh, potential threat to the stability of the region, including South China Sea issues that we've mentioned, but not only those. And in this particular time of great power competition, I think Vietnam's role is increasing because of its relatively shrewd foreign policy. But I think the US-Vietnam relations are on upswing. There are a lot of 
benefits and positives coming out of that, including, you know, growing investments from U.S. companies to Vietnam. Major tech companies have been relocating to Vietnam since the trade war or tech war even. Um, so Vietnam's position in global supply chain, especially in semiconductors, as a result, has grown because of relocation of those big tech from China into Vietnam. That's one benefit, the economic one. But also, U.S. was very helpful in donating and supplying Vietnam with vaccines, for example, during the COVID. And without U.S. and its partners and allies vaccines, I think Vietnam would have had much harder time with uh, dealing with COVID and therefore, of course, the spillover effect on economy and, and society and political stability as well. I know that you talk about the convergence of strategic thinking between America and Vietnam. And and also we should note that the US Secretary of State recently did point out America's respect for Vietnam's multi-directional foreign policy. But at some point, if Vietnam continues to build relations with the US, is it going to become increasingly difficult when you put that relationship in the context of the US China relationship. How does Vietnam navigate that? Yes, yeah, so this is a dilemma that not only Vietnam but many countries in the region are uh, dealing with, and that's why you probably hear the popular mantra in the region saying that don't make us choose, or you know we don't want to choose, meaning we don't want to choose between US or China. And it's actually a moving target because in the early years. The Vietnamese Communist Party and the government was relatively apprehensive of the U.S., even after the normalization and its role in the region and potential influence in peaceful evolution or creating democratic influences and therefore challenging its political control in the country. Now, this has gradually subsided and The fear now has moved on to being pressured to take sides, as I mentioned earlier. But I think in the recent years, the U.S. government has recognized that sufficiently enough to be uh, reassuring Vietnam about its lack of intention to interfere in any way with the domestic matters of Vietnam, or even increasingly so in terms of diplomatic reassurance that U.S. is not there to impose choices and will not ask countries to choose side. Now, on the practical level, how it will be doable, it is a question mark because with that tech war and trade war, some fear that that might eventually end up being a de facto on a practical level to be imposing choices at some point. And Vietnam only trying to assert itself in that global supply chain will have so far benefited, as I mentioned, from the U.S. companies relocating or global companies relocating to Vietnam. But we need to be mindful as well that many of the products in the supply chain, in the semiconductors supply chain, and the path that Vietnam needs for production comes from China. So this is one of the worries that Vietnam uh, still has about this imposition of choice. So far, I think it is successful in articulating that with U.S. in particular, given that, as you mentioned, Secretary Blinken has reassured that the U.S. won't impose the choice, but it's clearly something on their mind. Of course, that's two great powers, China and the US. And there's another rather large one, and that's Russia. And Vietnam's got very long ties with Russia. But today, what's the nature of the relationship? Yes, it's another complicated one. It has been recently more complicated because of the war in Ukraine. Before that, Russia had been one of more closer partners of Vietnam, obviously, a legacy of the Soviet Union and partnership and even alliance at one point. And Russia, along with China, has the most top tier, so to speak, comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam. While economically, you know, Russia is not the top player in Vietnam, it is a top supplier of defense equipment. It is also you know, one of the top sources of tourists in Vietnam. 
But since the war, I think things are more complicated and the longer the war lingers, the more complicated it will be. Vietnam doesn't want to be seen as turning its back to its longtime partner and friend. But at the same time, you know, Ukraine is also a good partner and friend of Vietnam, given the history as well. So it is caught in that rather challenging position. It has declared neutrality since the war broke, but it also had on the people-to-people level had also supplied a lot of aid and assistance to Ukraine. So I think if the war continues to prolong, the role of Russia as the primary defense supplier will also have to be revisited. At the moment, you will see already that some steps being taken for Vietnam to diversify supply of the defense equipment. It's not going to be an overnight thing. It's not easy to change the system because, for example, the language, the usage and maintenance of the existing equipment will have to continue. But I think it is also a wake-up call for the Vietnamese decision makers to seek more diverse defense equipment sources, but also invest more in its own indigenous production. And and it has harbored such ambitions for some years now. Am I right that this is a wake-up call for Vietnam too about potential limitations to its foreign policy and walking that very fine line of multi-alignment but without annoying those you might consider allies and friends at the same time? is not <laughs> It's not an easy task. It's not an easy task and foreign policy and challenges to foreign policy is not going to slow down anytime soon. And I think the activeness and proactiveness of Vietnam will need to be even further sharpened and Vietnam's decision makers and leaders will have to invest more, not less, in foreign policy indeed to be able to very nimbly address and face the ongoing and upcoming challenges. So indeed, it is a very interesting area to be working on. Do you think Vietnam can continue to hedge in its foreign policy? Can you foresee circumstances where they may need to shift tack? I think for as long as possible, countries in the region and Vietnam included will want to continue hedging policy because this is um what they're most comfortable with without giving up too much of self-reliance or I think Vietnam certainly considered that as an agency multiplier. But depending on how relationship between US and China develop, that may or may not be feasible or the degree of that feasibility will change. Now, to extend that shelf life, Vietnam and other mid-sized countries in the region in ASEAN are advocating for a more stable, a more predictable great power relationship between China and the US so that they can have bigger room for maneuver. And one way of advocating for that is actually voicing that don't make us choose and we reject binary choices, right? That is something I think not only Vietnam, but most of the countries in the region subscribe for. And by amplifying that through ASEAN diplomatic platforms and beyond I think they make it clear for US and China that they're not interested in committing exclusively in either of binary camps and therefore also trying to influence to a degree they can uh, the great powers and their policies towards the region that the binary choices are not welcome in Southeast Asia. Hoang, thank you so much for uh, your insights and being so generous with your time. It's an absolutely fascinating uh, area. And uh, and as you say, it's an amazing area to be focused on and to work on. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time as well. Our guest has been writer, academic and policy analyst, Dr. Huang Lei Tu. And special thanks in this episode also goes to Melissa Conley-Tyler of the Asia-Pacific Development, Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue.
Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 18th of July, 2023. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.